Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you here this morning as we begin this, uh, the first reflection of our Advent Day of Prayer. So it's good to see so many people here, particularly good to see like two or three men. I don't know what it would take to get men more involved in these things. It's a great mystery. I haven't figured that one out yet, but it's great to see so many people here. I want to begin today a reflection during this year of mercy as we celebrate Our Lady of Guadalupe to do a little thought exercise. Actually, the talk, to, the two talks today are sort of expansions of the homilies that I gave over the course of the past week. And I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that you have, have died and passed away and your soul has ascended to the pearly gates where you're there and you meet, you encounter for first time Jesus. And he's there and he's smiling and he's so happy to see you. You also encounter Our Lady, the Blessed Mother, who is there and embraces you. And you can imagine that your heart is just filled with joy. You also then see standing behind them, let's say, all of your favorite saints. Of course, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, Padre Pio, St. Therese. And they are also sort of this welcoming party. So excited to see you. And then, standing alongside of them, you see your family, uh, friends, people that passed away years ago. Your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your your best friend growing up, whatever. Everyone's so happy to see you. And your heart is just so filled, you cannot wait to begin this eternity in heaven, worshiping God, seeing all your family and friends. How many of y'all is that hard to imagine? Probably not. But then... As you are walking towards them, the crowd splits, and there you see it, right behind them, that biggest jerk you ever encountered during your time on earth. The person, for whatever reason, caused you the most pain. Could have been that bully in school who made your life hell. It could have been someone who, who stole from you. It could be your your ex-spouse who cheated on you. It could be someone who murdered your child. It could be that priest who was mean to you in confession one day. I don't care what it is. The biggest jerk you ever met. What do you do? What do you experience with that person who hurt you and you found it impossible to forgive? that you bear a grudge in your heart a whole entire time. Okay, think of that. And I think of another similar situation. Think of it now, sort of the same in a way. You're already in heaven, and you've been there, and you're worshiping God, and with your, your family, and your friends, and the saints, and you're having a grand old time. And then you might imagine that whenever someone dies, and they come into heaven, like there's this big screen saying, Welcome to heaven. You know, Joe Blow or Bill Thibodeau or whomever. And on that screen is that big jerk, the person that you left behind on earth who hurts you the most, who is the most wrong to you. How do you feel or what would you experience in your heart? I can't believe that jerk's going to be here for eternity. I don't want everything to do with that person. In both of those cases, I mean, again, we're going to see heaven would not be like this. But what would you do if you could carry that resentment, that, that anger, that bitterness into heaven? What would heaven be like? Look like at one big party. You've been to a big party before where you're sitting around with your friends and you see that one jerk who comes in and you're like, I'm going to spend this whole evening sipping cocktails with my friends and I'm going to circle around and make sure I never have to pass that person. For this whole hour and a half I'm going to be here, I'm not going to talk to that person. And we've all done that. But is that what heaven is going to be like? Or can that exist in heaven? It can't. It can't exist in heaven. We know that. We know that heaven, as we all worship God, we are all part of that community of saints. There can be in our hearts no bitterness, no resentment, no hatred towards someone. Heaven is not that big party. 
but we can go around for all eternity. We can hang out with Padre Pio and St. Therese, but we're not hanging out with that group because we don't like them, because they did things to us. Heaven has got to be about peace. It's about harmony and living with God and others. There's no spite. There's no resentment. There's no unforgiveness in heaven. That doesn't exist. It can't exist. Will we agree on this? You can't. I mean, you can laugh about it. We can use our little thought experiment. So the question is, if we die and we get in the pearly gates and we see that person who we don't like, who we held a grudge against all those years, guess what? We can't go into heaven. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is going to send us into hell. No. Because we're still good people. We haven't, been ju- we haven't rejected God. We haven't rejected heaven. But we still have that resentment in our hearts that needs to be what? Purified. It needs to be purified. It needs to be removed so that we can enter into heaven and say, you know what? Yeah, we, we had it out on earth. Or you hurt me or I hurt you. Or yeah, I held a grudge. But I don't have that anymore. And to be able to give that big embrace and to be able to want to spend just as much time with that person who hurt you the worst on earth in heaven for all eternity. It blows our mind. We, we probably figure, like, oh, I really don't want to do that. But if you don't want to do that, then guess what? You're not going to be able to make it to heaven until that resentment, until that bitterness can be purified from our hearts. So what do we call that? Purgatory. I'm not saying this is all what purgatory is, but to a great degree, we talk about purgatory as this this state of being purified in Christ, of the temporal punishment due to sin, of the things that are sort of We've committed a sin. It's like we broke a window. We may be sorry, but the window still needs to be fixed. But when we have this sin and this bitterness and this resentment and unforgiveness, it binds us to people. That we're still connected to people, whether they're in heaven or they're on earth, is the second uh, sort of story made us think about. We can't make it into heaven until we are purified from that until those bonds of guilt are cut, until they're split. And a lot of times we don't want to let go. We like holding on to our, our anger. We like holding on to that sense of feeling justified. That person hurt me. They did me wrong. I'm not going to forgive them. I have every right to hold on to this. If we expect to make it to heaven, it is going to have to be purified, either now or later. We get the choice to own that's going to be. Any, any residual thing that would stop us from entering into communion with our brothers and sisters in heaven must be purified. These bonds of guilt that connect us to other people, of anger and resentment, must be split. So this really, though, is a new way or sort of a creative way of looking at purgatory, of understanding it. It's not something I came up with, my little analogies I did, but it's something that Joseph Ratzinger, who of course later became Pope Benedict XVI, talks about. He says in purgatory, purgatory means still unresolved guilt, a suffering which continues to radiate out because of me. Purgatory means then suffering to the end what one has left behind on earth the pain that we've caused other people, or even the pain that we, the, the resentment we hold. It so binds us to other people, specifically binds us to earth, as he says. That has to be purified. That has to be removed. And it comes to that encounter with Jesus who burns it away. We so desire to be with him, to be with our brothers and sisters. We don't want anything to stop it. So we say, willfully, Lord, you burn this away. I want to be able to get into heaven. I don't want anything to stop me. So, so imagine it this way. And again, I'm kind of taking these thought exercises and extending them. Imagine Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, right after he, he shot himself and his head committed suicide, let's say in a second. And all of a sudden, by this just tremendous grace, he repented of what he did. 
and repented of what he did. And he gets there to the pearly gates. But you know what? Jesus says, not only have you committed a lot of sin and you're going to be turning the lights out in purgatory, dude. Um, But think of all the people that he's hurt, that he's connected to, and that it's still maybe harbor anger against him or that he still harbors anger against all of the Jewish people his enemies that would still need to be purified an intense intense purification that would happen because of the suffering he left behind and because of that resentment and bitterness that he might still have in his heart so there we can see it even though we're not Hitler we still are connected to people in that way, by people that we've hurt, or by people who've hurt us, and we've been unwilling or incapable of forgiving them. So why do I bring all of this up? Well, it's something I think interesting for us to think about, because we realize if we really want to get to heaven, if we really want to encounter Jesus, we need to start working on this right now. We need that purification. We need that transformation. But I'm using this reflection to really begin our day of prayer together as we focus on and we celebrate the year of mercy. Everything that I've mentioned so far and that need for purification and that need to be able to forgive even our worst enemy because guess what? Our worst enemy may make it to heaven. And we're going to have to live for eternity with that jerk. You've got to be able to find a way to learn to love and embrace them. So mercy is central, not just to the gospel, not just to being a Christian in a whole, but to our salvation, to our inheriting eternity. So I'll give you a couple of passages. Both of them from the gospel of Matthew. Um, I I have the the Bible here so I'll go ahead and and read the passages they're ones that we know the first is Matthew chapter 5 verses 23 to 26 he says whoever um, sorry if you bring your gift to the altar and there Recall that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother. And then come and offer your gift quickly. Settle with your opponent quickly while on the way to court with him. Otherwise, your opponent will hand you over to the judge. And the judge will hand you over to the guard. And you will be thrown into prison. Amen. I say to you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. What is Jesus basically saying here? If somebody's got something with us, go reconcile them. Or if we got something with them, go finish it before you bring your gift to the altar. You can say before you bring the gift of your life to heaven, before you lay it at the altar in heaven, you need to go reconcile. If you don't, if you hold that guilt into you, guess what? You're going to be thrown into prison until you pay the last penny. You're going to be purified until your gift is ready to be presented. That our holding on to guilt, that stuff that binds us to other people, stops us from presenting the the gift. What about Matthew chapter 18? We all know this. This is the parable of the unforgiving servant. And so you know when Peter says, If my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus answered, No, seven times, seventy times. And so he gives the account of this man who was brought before this lord who owed him a large amount. And the man said, Listen, I have no way to pay this. And said, Please be patient. And so the master says, All right, I forgive you. This is Matthew 18, verses 25 to 35. And then he's all excited. The master forgave him. But he goes and sees someone who owed him a smaller amount. And what does he do? He shakes him down and says, you had better pay me back. But he didn't. So he threw him into prison. Well, his other servants, his other friends saw this. 
and reported it back to the big master. And the big master was deeply upset. And he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers so until he should pay back the debt. So will my heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgives his brother from his heart. So he doesn't say he threw him into to prison forever. He doesn't say he went to hell. He says you're going to have to go until you pay back the debt, until you're purified, until those bonds can be forgiven and that we can learn to live in forgiveness and mercy. It's interesting, notice, Matthew here and a lot of other places in the gospel uses this idea or this analogy of paying a debt. Why is that? Why do you think Matthew uses that idea of money or paying a debt a lot? He was a tax collector. He took his own experience and used it. God inspired him using his own experience to be able to uh, convey these truths. Even as our Father, pay us, you know, pay, help us to, you know, the debt, the debts of your, our debtors, help us to pay those. So that's the thing. We need, Christ says, to be able to give mercy and to be able to receive mercy if we expect to fulfill the gospel, but if we expect to make it fully into the kingdom of heaven. If there is someone in this life whom we cannot forgive, I don't care what they've done to us or done to someone we love, if we're holding a grudge, and again, a lot of the times, we can hold grudges for the stupidest, smallest things. And I'm going to be honest with you, from my experience as a priest, do you know who's really good at holding grudges, ladies? Ladies. <laughs> Guys, uh, sometimes, but not so much. We're mad at you, we're going to curse you out, maybe punch you in the face, and we'll have a beer, and then we're good. This just is the way that, that our hearts have evolved. You know, as one woman, for like 20 years, she held this grudge against like her sister-in-law because at Thanksgiving she criticized her china. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. You got but, but those things, again, it doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to be the drunk driver who, who, who killed your, 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 your child. It could be something so small. But if that stuff sits in our heart and begins to pollute it, then we are, and we can't forgive, we can't learn to let go then we are going to lock ourselves out of heaven until we can pay the last debt and find purification. It's because you, you're not going to have, the Lord will not have that discord and that disunity in heaven. He wants everyone to get along. He doesn't want cliques in heaven. He doesn't want factions in heaven. We have got to be able to call everyone in heaven our brother and sister. So there's going to have to be a serious period of purification where the Lord takes seriously purifying our hearts and cutting those bonds. But the truth is, as I said, we like to hold grudges. We love it. We love to that, that sense of self-righteousness. This person did me wrong. They betrayed me. They lied about me. They did whatever. Because what happens is we feel right. But ultimately, it's really pride. We're prideful. We say that we, we don't deserve to be treated that way. I'm not letting that person treat me that way, even if it's for the smallest thing. But as we heard in that passage before, seven times, 70 times, Jesus didn't say, oh, you can forgive people 10 times. Seven times 70 means infinite amount of times because the number seven is that perfect number. You never stop forgiving people. And granted, we could say it doesn't mean that you, a lot of people will walk all over you. There can come a limit. But you still learn to be able to forgive because you can't bind yourself in guilt to that person. It's not easy. It's really not easy. And that's one of the things that I've learned as a priest. It's wonderful for me to say this. And we can all agree Father, we need to learn to be able to forgive. 
We need to be able to learn to love our enemies. We need to be able to learn to have our hearts open up so wide. But that doesn't mean we can just snap our fingers and it happens. Sometimes, and some offenses can take a lifetime to learn to forgive. It can take a lifetime to have our hearts and our minds purified. So every time we see that person or think of that person, all those feelings, that nastiness, don't come up again. That we can look on them with love. So we can go over, I'm sure, a bunch of different examples of people that we need to learn to be able to forgive are types of offenses that really strike to the core of our being. But I want to look at just a handful now and try to give a couple of little stories that go along with it. Because so often what I found, and again, it's, it's Jesus says, forgive your enemies. You know what? Th- that that's not easy. People who've hurt us, who, who consider us their enemy. But what's more difficult is forgiving our friends, forgiving our loved ones. Because our enemies are supposed to hate us. They're not supposed to like us. They're jerks. But the people, our family and friends who hurt us, our, our spouses, our children, our best friend who turn coat and hurt us, who do things intentionally or unintentionally, that can cause the most pain. But both cases, we've got to be able to learn to forgive. But I think the first group is that. The first group that can often be the most difficult to forgive are friends and family members, loved ones who betray us. Not just who are mean to us or grumpy to us in the morning, but who betray us. Who take that knife and stab it right in our back. And sometimes take great pleasure, who sell us out, who throw us under the bus. We've all had that happen. Much easier to forgive uh, an enemy who talks bad about us. But that person, you were supposed to love me. You were supposed to be my friend as I thought you were and you did this to me. And this is something I preached about earlier this year for Holy Thursday. You know, we think so often of Christ and his passion and you know, how he suffered so much because of the the wounds in his hands or the the, the crown on his head or the scourge marks. Particularly, you've watched Mel Gibson's The Passion. You know you can really sort of feel that physical suffering. But Christ endured an intense interior suffering. And probably, I would argue, one of the worst sufferings Jesus endured was being betrayed by his friend Judas. It's so easy for us to say, Judas is the son of a gun. He's no good. But Judas is Jesus' friend. For three years, he lived with him and ate with him. Judas turned his heart evil as time went on. But he was Jesus' friend. And you, you, my friend, come and sell me out for 30 pieces of silver? That's it? Again, if the Pharisees would have been the only ones involved in it, it would have hurt the Lord because he loved the Pharisees, but this was his friend. And so whenever we've experienced that, 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 that betrayal, we realize that Christ understands that also. But notice, Jesus didn't say, you son of a gun, I'm coming after you. No. Judas chose his own fate by refusing to accept the Lord's mercy and forgiveness by focusing so much on himself. But Jesus was there willing to forgive Judas for even that. He loved Judas. Judas was his friend. And so we have to call that same grace when we have friends or loved ones or family members who betray us, who put that knife right in our back and laugh in our face when they do it. We've got to be able to forgive those people. Another group of people that we've got to be able to forgive are our enemies. The people who specifically gossip about us and try to destroy our reputation. There's one thing when you have an enemy right in front of you. I think of the people who don't go to your face and say bad things, but you know are destroying your reputation behind your back, trying to bring you down, saying really vicious, hateful things, whether they be true or untrue, whether they have reason to try to destroy your reputation or not. We are called 
to be able to forgive those people. Because what happens is the damage they do is often much larger because other people begin to believe those things. And quite often, it's not just one time. It's not the person who just shoots you one time and you've got to forgive him. This gossip goes on for weeks, months, if not years, as your reputation is destroyed. And here I think of that story, one of my favorite stories from Mother, who I know I'm sure you've heard, when she sort of first began her work in Calcutta, across the street was the Temple of Kali. Am I getting this right, sister? And the priest there of that Hindu goddess could stand Mother Teresa. I'm trash Mother Teresa, vilified her name, pitted people against her, turned friends against her, and made her life a living hell. But Mother never cursed the guy out, never talked bad about him, never said anything negative. And finally, after I think a number of years, this priest of Kali got sick, and he got leprosy maybe, and he was thrown out on the streets, and his friends abandoned him, saw him as, as, as an untouchable. And he was dying there, hungry, thirsty, miserable in the streets of Calcutta. And Mother Teresa heard about it. And even though this guy cheated her like dirt for so long, she set out to find that man and took him in and cared for him till he died. It's a powerful, powerful example of not allowing those things to, just, to hurt us and to be able to forgive those who do try to destroy our reputation. One of the big ones, and again, this is a sensitive one here, and it's very specific, and it kind of ties into the friends who betray us, is, is the need to forgive the spouse who commits adultery. Whether it be adultery with another man or another woman, depending on who they are, or if it be is pornography or any of that stuff. You know, blows people's minds. Adultery is not grounds for an annulment. Now, maybe if the person could not commit, there was something impossible, or they never intended to commit. But a mistake, or several mistakes, is not necessarily grounds for an annulment. But what I see now is, is, is granted, we do have our own rights, and we don't want our spouse to cheat on us. But one time this happens, boom, you're completely written off your spouse. Automatic divorce. Instead of trying to say, hey, let's talk about this. I'm really, really hurt. You have every right to be hurt. But let's try to work through this. I forgive you. Again, if it happens repeatedly, we've got an issue, maybe the person can't commit. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen it and the suffering it causes. You know, remember that Ashley Madison thing uh, a few months back? There are these men exposed from this being on this, this adultery website. Not a good thing at all. With the spouses who, without even a discussion, divorce their husband, not a good thing at all. And I'm not, I'm not in that situation. I can only imagine the tremendous pain and the tremendous betrayal. But to simply write off your spouse because you're hurt, what are you doing? I'm the right person. I had a right. I was hurt. I'm not even going to deal with you without thinking how it might impact the children how it might impact other people. And granted, there are serious adulterers out there, serial adulterers. These things can be dealt with. But without sitting down and trying to work things out about granting forgiveness, what happens is, is one spouse cuts the other one off immediately. Well, what they're doing is what? Just opening up the space for bitterness, resentment, hatred to enter in. And you can have some serious problems later on. Adultery is not a good thing. Pornography is not a good thing. We have got to be willing to love our spouses and bring them back because quite often, not all the time, quite often, whenever I have somebody who comes to me and they've committed adultery or they'll admit a confession, first question I ask is, how are things going at home with your wife? Eight times out of ten, or your husband. Eight times out of ten, not well. Quite often, people seek satisfaction elsewhere because there are problems at home. And those problems haven't been dealt with. And I'm not trying to cast the blame on the spouse who was cheated upon, not at all. But because uh, but simply cutting that person off, you never get to the root of the problem. You never find a chance for healing. And some of the marriages that I know that are the healthiest, 
are the ones where they've been able to find forgiveness. It's like that broken bone that comes back and bound, binds even stronger. And granted, there can be a lot of problems that come from that. We can allow manipulation and holding this over people's heads. Not a good thing at all. We need to learn to be able to forgive. Another one is, is, and I can't even begin to imagine this, is to be able to forgive those who harmed our loved ones, particularly our children. Particularly our children. I can't even begin to imagine how to forgive the person who kills a child, the drunk driver, or the one who molests one of our children, or abuses other people. I, I can't begin to imagine how that's done. But the Lord doesn't say, oh, I need you to forgive everybody. Oh, but you don't have to forgive these people. You need to forgive your enemies, but child molesters, you don't need to forgive. You don't need to forgive those people. He didn't say that. We need to learn to be able to forgive all those people. Because what if that person who does a horrible thing as a result of killing your child in that car accident ends up truly repenting and dying into heaven and going to heaven, and he's there and you're there, and you don't want to see him? Terrible, terrible suffering. Not good. We need to learn to be able to find some way to forgive. You remember, uh, what was that a few years ago? That uh, at Amish village where this, I think this man went in and killed a bunch of children in the schoolhouse. And that witness, that profound witness of the family members and the parents who issued and said, I forgive you for what you've done. Now, granted, they probably had a lot of work to do. It doesn't mean all of a sudden they just said they forgave the person and went away. But at least wanting to forgive that person. Or, or the, the young man who went in uh, South Carolina and killed the people in the church. And they went and said, I forgive you. They, call, you know, as he, they were seeing him on the screen at his hearing. We forgive you for what you've done. Our forgiveness is a journey. That's a profound, profound witness. And we can see a lot of times in literature and film other, other things like this. How it's done it has got to be God's grace. But once again, I'm trying to, to emphasize there's not a subset of people that Jesus says you don't have to forgive. Because that subset of people, whether it be your ex-spouse who cheated on you, whether it be the person who killed your child, those people could be in heaven. What are you going to do if you get there and you see them? Are you going to lock yourself out of heaven because you can't spend eternity with that person? Or are you going to begin to purify your heart and learn forgiveness? Here's the last group that I have found probably for Catholics is the most difficult group of people to forgive. I don't even say difficult people to difficult. People don't even think about forgiving these type of people. They make one sin, the smallest type of sin. They can be having a bad day and they will hold a grudge against them for the rest of their life. Anybody want to guess who that group of people is? Priests. Priests. Priest. I'm not here playing the victim at all. But it is ridiculous what I've seen as a priest. You know what? And again, maybe partially because I'm glad people expect priests to be holy and good. But you know what? Sometimes priests have bad days. Sometimes our backs hurt. Sometimes we have our own pains and sufferings you don't know about. And sometimes as a result, we're not as kind as we should be. We're not as loving as we should be. And sometimes priests are just jerks. And they're mean and they're hateful. But the absolute unwillingness to forgive a priest, and not only right off the priest, but right off the whole church, I I've never seen it done to another subset of people. I've never. And it's disturbing. It it's painful and it hurts. Particularly because a lot of the times you don't even know you're the person who's done it. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, Father, I met someone who was a parishioner of wisdom for your first week there until you did something to that person. I made him so angry. Like five years later, he was shaking in rage talking about you. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, if I've deliberately hurt somebody, I'm pretty aware of it. There's a priest, I'm sure, maybe I was having a bad day or I, I, I reprimanded someone. I don't know what I did. I can't remember. It's nothing in my mind. I said, you go back and you tell that person. If whatever Father did, he didn't even know it. He's sorry. But for you to hold a grudge for five years that makes you so angry you tremble in rage, you have a really, really serious problem, sir. 
And you better resolve that before you die. Again, when it comes to the anger of priests for molesting children and the bishops for, for, for colluding and hiding it, that's some very just and righteous anger. I, I can understand that. But for the smallest, stupidest little things, and quite often, the priest is completely justified. I'm leaving the church because the priest would not anoint my three-year-old baby who was in the hospital. Well, guess what? The priest can't anoint your three-year-old baby because you can only anoint people once they're seven and above. Maybe the priest could have, like, put his hand on the head and rubbed some other kind of oil to make you think that he was really anointing the baby. But don't get mad at the priest for doing something he can't do. I never went back to church because the priest told me I shouldn't shack up with my girlfriend before I'm getting married. That's like getting mad at the cop for giving you a ticket for speeding. It's not the cop's fault. He's just following the rules. You're the one you should be mad at because you are the one speeding. You're the one shacking up. You're the one not following the rules. But it's that, 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 that sense of self-entitlement. I'll never have anyone tell me right or wrong. We've got to be able to learn to forgive our priests and more understand priests are human too. Priests not only need to learn to be able to say they're sorry when they do things that are wrong. Priests do do things that are wrong, but we understand that. There are other groups of people too, but those are five that I really, in my time as a priest, found that people really struggle with being able to forgive. So what these people are in general... What are some of the keys to forgiving? And that's something that, that people, uh, you can apply and you can tell the people, I'm going to give you three keys to forgiving. Doesn't mean they're, it's easy. Doesn't mean you just put the key in the door and you turn it open and all of a sudden, move I can forgive. I can show mercy, but it helps. Number one, trying to have some understanding of the person who hurt you in their situation. Quite often the person who hurts you is probably hurting too. To understand why they are the way they are. What led them to that. And in a certain sense, to make excuses for the other person. Yeah, that person yelled at me, but you know what? They're probably having a bad day. The other day I went to the restaurant, and the waitress was terrible. Didn't smile, was rude. And I was said there, I said, I'm going to give that lady a tip of zero. But I realized, I I don't know what happened. Maybe she got in a fight with her parents. Maybe her baby was sick and she couldn't sleep. Maybe she was tired. Maybe she hates priests. I don't know. But I don't know that. So I said, let me try to have some understanding and to be more forgiving and to have act with kindness. If we do that, we try to understand and make excuses, then we're not going to hold as much against that person. But quite often, we don't want to. We don't want to understand why the person did it. I'm right. I don't care what the other person's going through. They hurt me. And that brings to the second point. Goodness gracious, let's have some humility. Let's have some humility. A deep awareness of our own sinfulness and the thing that we're mad at that person for and we're unforgiving. Guess what? We've probably done it to other people. We've probably hurt other people in the same way. Albeit for the grace of God, there go I. That same thing that we're so self-righteous about. We've probably done it to other people. The humble person was deeply aware of their own weakness and their own sinfulness, and their own capacity to do other stuff. So they're not going to judge. They're going to be less likely to hold a grudge. They're deeply aware of their own weakness and the weakness of other people. They're not surprised by these things. They know how dirty and filthy and mean people can be, and how dirty and filthy and mean they can be. And third and finally, and and I give this recommendation to everyone, you know when you used to go to the doctor, and the doctor would be like, all right, you're sick, you have two options. You can take the pills, the penicillin pills for two weeks, the antibiotics for two weeks. I'll give you a quick shot in the butt. It's going to hurt, but you're going to get well in about a day or two. And as a kid, you wanted the pills so you could stay away from school as longer, but you also didn't want the pain. So what's the, what's the penicillin shot, the quick way to help to be able to forgive someone, to let go of that resentment? I'm not saying it works overnight. Is to learn to call down blessing on that other person. I mean, written really mean it. I just say, I hope the Lord teaches him a lesson and he grows spiritually. <laughs> no. Lord, that person who hurt me, you know what? I want, I want them to be truly happy. I want you to give them all the blessings in the world. To say the same loving things that you might say for your children or your spouse or the people who are close to you. To really call down blessings upon your enemies. 
Scripture says that. When people curse you, don't give back another curse, give back a blessing. To really bless them and make it a habit. And you can make a list of the people who have hurt you and say, like that person, every day I'm going to call down blessings on this person until I really, really mean it. And you're going to find that eventually the walls break down. Without a doubt, we're praying through all this, we're asking for the grace. And granted, that prayer, that blessing prayer, is often very, very effective. To bless those people, that is that, it's hard. We don't want to, but that's what helps to purify our heart. It helps us to be able to show mercy. So I want to close today with, with sort of focusing a little bit on Our Lady. And in that same writing where our, our Pope Benedict talks about purgatory as sort of that need for purification of those connections we have to people in time or in heaven and our unforgiveness, he talks about Our Lady. And he notices that Mary, and we just celebrated this the other day, Mary was conceived without sin. Mary never sinned. What does that mean? That she doesn't have any resentment in her heart towards anyone, even the people who hurt her son. She never hurt anyone herself. She never caused anybody else to sin. And so what our, our, our Holy Father says, he says, Mary is fully in the Father's house through the assumption since no guilt came forth from her to make people suffer. When she got to heaven, there was no one there who she'd say, I don't want to deal with that jerk for the rest of eternity. Nor was there anyone on earth that she was bound to, that she had made suffer, that she had hurt, that she had wronged, that she had betrayed. And there was no resentment, no unforgiveness. So in a certain sense, the earth couldn't hold her. She was assumed into heaven. There was nothing binding her, big or small, to anyone on earth. But Mary's sinlessness is the key that she didn't need to be purified of anything in heaven or on earth. And so as we begin our, our year of mercy and as we continue our Advent season, as we sort of get into our day of reflection today, it's so important to begin asking for her intercession. We're going to be serious about wanting to get to heaven. We're going to be serious about wanting to experience Christ's mercy and to show mercy of others so that we can begin this process of purification on earth. No way to say, I'm going to keep these grudges and when I die and purgatory, I'll just sit there and have Jesus take care of it then. Let's start, let's start it now. Let's start it now so we can live in that true freedom of the sons of God. So I would suggest, and you could do this today if you want, or you could do it during the year of mercy. Let's get practical. On your, your notepad or on your Evernote or whatever, let's make a list of all the people that you still haven't fully forgiven. Big ways and small ways. Some of you may have a list of about five or six people. Some of you may need a couple notebooks. I don't know. You make that list. There was that lack, what you wrote is a lack of mercy, a lack of forgiveness, a lack of understanding, a lack of compassion, that you're bound to that person or they're bound to you. And start working on breaking those chains. Start working to find freedom, to find forgiveness. Through prayer, we talked about through calling blessing on the people, asking the grace of forgiveness, and what, what we call reparation, to repair you need to go and tell that person you're sorry and sit down and talk to them. Take care of business. <laughs> if that person needs to hear that you forgive them, go tell them that. Do the work you can now to repair those bonds. And so what happens is why? When we learn to forgive or when we accept mercy, there's one theologian who taught me in seminary he said, every sort of moment of forgiveness is like a resurrection. An old friendship, an old relationship that, that fell apart, it died. When we learn to give mercy or receive mercy, it's risen to new life. It's risen to new life. And so that connects us to what we're talking about. The resurrection. We want to be in heaven. We want to be able to embrace and one day see our brothers and sisters and, and in Christ and not hold anything against anyone. Start beginning now in those small resurrections, sort of lead the way and point the way 
to what, God willing, we will experience in the world to come. Amen.